Okay, this is uh, the Veritasium channel that I'm going to be showing his explanations of, of all this kind of stuff. He's a nice guy. I think his name is Derek Mueller, something like that. I think it's Derek, but I can't find his name here anywhere. So anyway, we're going to go to his claims, and I will comment on my claims if I agree or disagree, and if I have any evidence to support my disagreements. Okay, shocker du jour. This is, I believe his name is Derek Mueller, and he's a very intelligent guy, and he presents evidence to support his side of things. Only today, Derek, I think you're wrong, and I am going to call him out on this. Now listen to what he has to say. I think it's just kind of wild that this is one of those things that we use every day that almost nobody thinks about or knows the right answer to. These traveling electromagnetic waves around power lines are really what's delivering your power. <laughs> no, Derek, I don't believe that's true. There is absolutely going to be some disturbance in the magnetic field as the electricity flows, no question. But that is not the major amount of electricity that's doing the work. All right, I'm establishing a little credibility here. This was my final paper on on atomic bonding and particles and what all of the orbitals and the, the bonding and non-bonding and nature of everything. And I really had it all down to dipole moments and the whole thing. And it came out to be that everything was dipoles. And light is atomic dipole vapor. And this was some more of my work at this particular time about intermolecular forces, two types, dipole-dipole interactions. There's more molecular polarities, dipole moments. This is, this, like I said, this goes back to 1970, right after I got out of the Army. And this was my final decision, was the transfer of energy is from light to atomic vapor. Just like moisture is the vapor of water. When you condense it, it turns into water. When you condense light, it turns into atoms. When you condense atoms, they turn into molecules. When you condense molecules, they turn into matter. Everything is based on light. It's all dipole-dipole moments. And I mean, I went as deep as anybody in the whole entire world. There was nobody that exceeded my research. Nobody. Zero. You know, I wasn't in, hooked in with any big institutions or anything, but trust me, I did more than they did. And I understood what I was doing, too, and they did not, because they did not understand dipole molecular moments. All right, this is what I did in the Army. I was in, uh, I was a 52D20, which is gas, gas turbines and generator repairmen, all of that business. I, I was at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, powerman, precise power generation, gas turbines, general repair, generator repairman, and up in Alaska for two years for service in the Nike Hercules missile sites, all their power needs, because they were on their own. They had, they had to develop their own power systems. And, and then I had my own business in uh, electronics, you know, sales and service, um, up until just recently when I retired. So I, I'm pretty familiar with this stuff. All right, he wants to get, if anybody can call him out on it, he wants to respond. Well, I'm calling him out on it. Listen to what he has to say. Is it's not really what's happening in the wires that matters. It's what happens around the wires. And the electric and magnetic fields can propagate out through space to this light bulb, which is only one meter away, in a few nanoseconds. And so that is the limiting factor for the light bulb turning on. Now, the bulb won't receive the entire voltage of the battery immediately. It'll be some fraction, which depends on the impedance of these lines and the impedance of the bulb. Now, I asked several experts about this question and got kind of different answers, but we all agreed on these main points. So I'm going to put their analysis in the description in case you want to learn more about this particular setup. If I get called out on it and people don't think it's real, we can we can definitely invest the resources and, and string up some lines and make our own power lines in the I, desert. I think you're going to get called out on it. Um, I agree. I think you're going to get called out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you out, brother. <laughs> so, I think that's right. <laughs> I think it's just. <laughs> I'm calling you out, man. Let's talk. All right. Now, you, you have to understand what a Venturi is. This is a Venturi. 
And all of Venturia's is a restriction like this. So all the particles coming down in a big ball have to squeeze down through this little tiny slit here. All right, when they do, they crush together. All their fields squish together, and you get this. And that's what this is right here. This is raw electron energy. The black particles can't get through. They're pushed back. Electron shower, exactly what they say at CERN and Fermilab. They just don't know how to do it. We did. But we still use light. You can't do it with this. You can't do it with these huge particles. You just get nothing but garbage. And you, they could never see like we can see because we're using something that just picks up light. And that's all this is, is light. It's ex extremely intense. But when they break their particles, they get chunks like this. That destroyed the CMOS. So they had to upgrade CERN to be able to, to use the same technology, and they did. And I went to the University of Geneva, and I told them that's how what we, we were doing, using C CMOS as complementary metal oxide silicates, semiconductors, whatever you want to call the last S, but it's complementary metal oxides. And they pick up different frequencies of, of energy, and then they convert them into pictures. And every single pixel in the CMOS has its own amplifier so we can see that's why we can see this everyone oh you can't see that yes you can <laughs> there's no question you can see it and there's no question what it is either it's exactly what they say it is and it is exactly what fermilab had found as well okay get ready for this this is an atomic bomb blast we're going to see the flash and we're going to hear a which is the Whistler wave. Now listen to it. Here it comes. Did you hear that? You just hear hear any nuclear blast yet. You can see it. But now it's coming at us. You see this? This is the dark particles coming at us. That wave coming across the desert. So we have not heard anything other than that blur. Now we're going to hear the blast. This is the dark, dark black part of us, and all of a sudden, blam! There it goes. That's the blast. Okay, this is AdamCentral.com. They're going to test this house. They're going to move all that stuff out, and now they have a hardened camera. Now I'm going to slow this down. Whoops, let me turn the sound off. God, it does that. Anyway, what they did was they just set off the atomic bomb. All the white stuff is hitting here, and it has no mass to it. The poles, they just smoke. They smoke. It just smokes up. It doesn't even go up. No push whatsoever. Now watch this. You know, it's running very slow, but it's still, you can see, obviously, it's none, there's no push to it whatsoever. That's the white particles. There's no mass. Now, Watch, it just vaporizes, and there comes the white, uh, black, black particles and push it like crazy. That's what it's all about with an atomic bomb blast. The white goes first, burns everything, smokes it, and, but it doesn't move it. And then the black comes and off it goes. So that just tells you that that black is in the center of all of the white particles. That's why we never see it. It's inside there. There's no black matter there. Yes, it is. It was right dead in the dead in the center where all that black particles surrounded it. All right, this is going to sound crazy, but it's absolutely true. This is a sub-atomic nuclear explosion. Right there. And what does that mean? It divided the white and the black. What are these? Those are the Whistler waves. Those are the acoustic waves. And then the stuff starts to catch up. And there is the white particles that burnt the house up. And the house just smoked. Didn't even move it. Didn't even move the smoke. And then the black came from behind. There goes the house. And that's because these are very compressed waves. These are just the white particles only. The black particles are on the move. The black particles are the moving particles. They are the carrier of the white. The harder they push against that white, the more the white glows. Basically, that's it. And through the Venturi, they push very hard. 
All right, this was another one done by um, Fabian Boulay. And he did the green and the red, both at the same time, coming through the same venture. So he had like two lasers, you know, something like these type of lasers, I believe. One right up here and one down here, one red, one green. Now, coming through, you can see the difference in energetic value here compared to here. All right, one of them is kind of dim looking. The, the red compared to the green. Now, also, the green was so powerful that it tumbled the red. That doesn't happen. They're supposed to spin like this. That's spinning like that. Can you see that? And then the green goes on further. You see how tumbly those look? That's not supposed to be like that. They do not do that. But because the the two white particles were one was passing by the other one so fast it just started made it spin and you know they're the same particles like rod saw but rod had it's got to have something to do with this phone now i i didn't have much success myself and i had such good work done by rod primarily that i just didn't bother and i you know somebody could certainly do this i don't have time to do it myself i have all the evidence already so Okay, my friends, get ready for this. This is one of my top subjects, is electron, dipole electron flood theory, which is my evidence, not just a theory. I, it was a theory for 50 years, and now I have the evidence to support it in experiments. And it shows what light is literally made of, which is what matter is made of, because matter is made of light. Light is an atomic vapor atoms. It's an atomic vapor. It condenses into atoms. This was my theory back in 1970, 1970. Right after I got out of the army, I went into this and I was shut down because of academics and nobody could ever prove or disprove that theory until just recently within the last 10 years, 12 years, where we actually can see these particles. And I have shown this many, many times, and I'm going to show it again today. And I'm going to explain to you how electricity does move. And they will never, ever understand this until they understand dipole electron flood theory and what an actual atom of, or an actual particle of light and what an actual electron is. Because the dark matter is attached to the electron. The electron glows. The dark matter is the carrier, and it's the weight. And it's just it's right in front of our face, but you can't see it because the glowy stuff always coats everything, and it bounces back at you. But behind that is the dark matter. Nobody's ever seen it before. And I can show it to you. So let's get started. Okay. A good friend of mine, Oscar Rosales, laid all this out, and it's up online, dipoleelectronflood.com. And all it is, is everything there is, is dipoles. It means the positive and the negative. The black goes to the center. I would have never expected this. I always expected a bar magnet. You couldn't break them apart, the positive from the negative. And you can't until you get down to the subatomic level. Above that, you break it off. You got one bar magnet and another bar magnet. You break them again, you got four bar magnets. You break them again, you got eight or 16 or whatever. They never separate positive to negative, but they do in the subatomic realm, and we can get the white part away from the dark part. That's dark matter, and it's also called a muon, and this is an electron, okay? Electron neutrino, muon neutrino. When they're stuck together, you'd call them a gluon, but they can come apart, and I can show this, no question whatsoever. And when this, this is a gluon is nothing more than actually an electron. We always thought it was just a negative part, and it, it was just a negative burning little part which is electricity causes lightning and static and all that stuff and electricity. Well, it's not. You have a positive part that has to push this. This doesn't go by itself. It won't go anywhere. And it has no mass to it. Nothing whatsoever. And I can show this, and I will right now. When that thing goes through the air, it, it, you'll see what happens. You, you have the mass following the burn. Now, two of these back-to-back -back make a photon. 
That's what flows through, and they bounce off of things. These don't bounce. They incorporate into things like electricity, static electricity, heat. And there's going to be some changes to science and chemistry and space. The redshift is not, there's no such thing as a redshift. You know, you can pull the light away, yes, but that's not what's happening. The light is just slowing down. It's coming to us. Light slows down, speeds up. I, I have all of this documented and actually in experimental evidence. So this is nothing more than denial of reality now in physics. All right, the beauty of this research now is I can actually show you the actual particles of light, and these are them, and there's different colors, there's the red, the blue, and the green, those are understood, and these are the actual particles, and they are particles, and 1823 of these particles, which are little bar magnets, in a ball, make up a hydrogen proton, it makes up a proton. Now, normally they say it's something like this, and when they smash them together, they get all little bits and pieces. Actually, they're only working with two little bits and pieces, and these are them right here. And these are the ones that they found at Fermilab, exact same ones we found, here's the ones that we found. Now, this is all they can do is show these particles, because they, they can't see them basically and understand that they make up photons and the two together make up what we would consider an electron. And they can break apart. The black can break apart from the white. Right here. The black is separated from the white. Electron neutrino is the white. It turns into electron showers. Pretty obvious. The black was the muon neutrino, which is a black, and it stays itself. It's called a sterile muon. And there they are right there. And here they are here as light. Now, we did these light experiments. Rod Warren basically pioneered this whole thing. And some other people caught on a little bit. I did some, but nothing like Rod. He was, the, he was the guy. And all it is, is he started out with two pins together, basically like this, in front of a, a laser and shined it through the slit and photographed it with a CMOS, a regular cell phone, this exact same cell phone, Samsung, Galaxy S3. This goes back to 2012, I think. And he was using the selfie side and, tsh, 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 and picking up all these, <laughs> these particles of light. Exact same thing as they're seeing at CERN. Only CERN and them are hitting these big, huge things together. Tsh, and all kinds of junk go flying. So they have really no idea what they're looking at. When they see it, instead of seeing this gorgeous detail, they see stuff like this, just piles of debris coming off. All right, you got a proton and a neutron. And then some of it is just like ours. They can see photons. They just don't understand them. They don't know what they are. They think that's a, a, a basic a tiny particle, tiny particle. But they're not. They're all made out of, every one of them is a little tiny bar magnet like that. You put them together, two of them together make light. And then from there, the next zone of stability is, is appears to be 1823, according to Millikan's oil drop experiment on the weight of an electron. If that's correct, we'd have to go with 1823. This is very simple stuff, because we want to get down to the tiniest little particles that exist. They come in as these photons, just like this. They go through the venturi as they separate, but they come right back together as the photons. That's their natural configuration. The venturi is just like two little pins, and you shoot the light right through it. It's like that right there. It's as simple as that. The smaller the venturi, the tighter the squeeze. The tighter the squeeze, the less white, I mean, the less black gets through. You can have, well, I'll show you. All right, this is Fermi Lab. This goes way back to 2013. I talked to them. 2014, somewhere around there, because we were finding the same particles. And they do exactly the same thing they say. This one has all the mass and that has all the burn. They're exactly what we found. And normally they look like this. All right, there's the Fermi Lab ones with the glowy edge around the black. Here's ours, the glowy edge around the black, glowy edge around the black. This one can get big and small and has no weight to speak of. And when it accelerates, 
we can break the muon neutrino away from the electron neutrino and get s sterile black muons and get electron showers. We did all this, and for some reason they refused to discuss it. You know, and it, they have an extremely large budget, and I think that's why. All right, so you know these are the two smallest particles they can find. And they do say that the, the extended particle is a fixed size. That's the black one. Can't get any smaller. Has a fuzzy edge around it, yes. The other one, the glowy one, is a point-like particle and has zero size. It, it, it can get down to almost nothing. And, and it has no weight because an atomic bomb, the white stuff hits first and just burns it up in smoke. And then the black comes and smashes everything to bits. So I do agree with this, their statement about what that par those particles actually are. And that's where all your mass is, and that's dark matter. It's a muon neutrino. This is your electron neutrino, and that's where all your burn is, all your energy. All right, let me just give you one roundabout here. This is a bunch of pictures that are light. And this is just light as it's just beginning to accelerate. You wouldn't even see that wave if it wasn't starting to go forward, pushing hard against all these particles. Normally, they just flow through the air and you don't really see them until they impact. Well, this is impacting very hard because it's being pulled by the Venturi. And what is a Venturi? I think I explained it, but this is what a Venturi is. There's the light coming forward, heading towards this Venturi right here. And all that Venturi is is a restriction. So all the particle fields coming down have to crush into each other to get through here. Just like they're hitting head on. They're crushing sideways, that's all. No difference. And they have to accelerate. That, just like a hose. You take a hose, tsh, you put the nozzle tighter and tighter, it goes further and further. But it has to suck it through there. And that's exactly what happens. It accelerates this. And the particle itself is pulled completely out of the magnetic field. And it, it right here, it concusses with itself, bouncing back, just like all these fields do. Like I said, they fall through here. You don't even see them because they're, they're not concussing hard enough. But now they're being pushed back at. So we see these exactly like this one. And the only reason we see this one because it's being pulled forward. <laughs> but at here, they all, at this, this spot, it's being pushed back at so hard that it just feels like it hit a wall. And that's when you see the photons. All right, and that's the photon right here. All right, before that, it's, it's what they call um, neutrinos. They're, they're not quite of a strength yet to be a photon. They're, they're gaining energy. That's they call them flavors. And this is the uh, Higgs fields. As it comes through the Venturi, looking into the Venturi, we see these fields. And those fields happen just like make, they turn back into something like this. So it, it starts like this. It comes out like that. They're basically the same thing. If you look at these fields right here, they're the same thing as this fields coming out this way. So they break them apart and they come back together. That's fission and fusion. This is light slowing down. This is a blue laser. It comes in real hot up here. And then it slows down down here. Light can speed up, light can slow down, light's particles, there's a black one, a white one, it's a dipoles, it's, it is what it is, and now it's very obvious to what it is. And to have them not be able to examine this and speak with us, is, uh, it's just not science. And here's the green, same particle, only green is much more powerful. And these are the neutrino values. They're not quite up to a photon yet. Those are the neutrinos. And the red happens the same way. The red, uh, I got it somewhere, but this is what it is. And light spins. Light doesn't flap like a wave. Light spins like this. And here is where they're really getting crushed because that's the Venturi. And again, it's simple. It's so simple, it's unbelievable. And all this is, this is exactly, exactly what this was done with. This particular Bosch pulse red laser and this Samsung phone. Chick, 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 taking these pictures. It's not rocket science. Okay, you should be able to see that this is the wave and this is the particle being accelerated and this is when it comes into full fruition and explodes like a bomb makes all these light up brilliantly 
And here the black stays away and all the white, only white, no black whatsoever is coming through here. It's 100% white. And then the black is just waiting over here to jump back in and on the edges. Let me show you a closer shot of that. But this is fission where they break apart and this is fusion where they come back together. And the only reason, only way we had to do this is just to put a restriction in there. We didn't have to add any energy whatsoever. Now here's where the construction of the Venturi comes into play. This one here is so finely tuned that only the white can get through. There's absolutely no black getting through there whatsoever. None. Zero. However, the see the black is just waiting over here to jump in. As soon as it, the light is at a, apparently it slows down a taste. And then they jump in. At a certain distance out here, they jump in. But they, here, they're pushed back. And every one of these balls is the same size. Every one is the same size. But, and the only reason you can see them is because they're sitting on top of the white energy, of the glowy energy. Otherwise, you can't see them. Dark matter. It's always, almost always behind the white. Everything, everything that you look at is coated with the white particles, and the black is always behind. That's why it's dark matter. But here, laying on top of the white, we can see it. All right, he's saying how long would it take to turn on the light bulb if you switch the switch. He'll show you in a second, I think. How far, how many seconds? Now listen to what he has to say. But I want you to commit to an answer and put it down in the comments so you can't say, oh yeah, I knew that was the answer when I tell you the answer later on. This question actually relates to how electrical energy gets from a power plant to your home. You know, unlike a battery, the electricity in the grid comes in the form of alternating current, or AC, which means electrons in the power lines are just wiggling back and forth. They never actually go anywhere. So if the charges don't come from the power plant to your home, how does the electrical energy actually reach you? When I used to teach this subject, I would say that power lines are like this flexible plastic tubing, and the electrons inside are like this chain. So what a power station does is it pushes and pulls the electrons back and forth 60 times a second. Now at your house, you can plug in a device like a toaster, which essentially means allowing the electrons to run through it. So when the power station pushes and pulls the electrons, well, they encounter resistance in the toaster element, and they dissipate their energy as heat, and so you can toast your bread. All right, so it, first of all, what is actually heat made of? They are everybody, and I think he, Derek also believes that heat is nothing more than shaking back and forth electrons. That is not necessarily true. Shaking back and forth electrons 100% causes heat. However, excess electrons inside of mass also creates heat. Like, like, let's just take, I'm going to show you an example. Very, very simple to understand this. All right, don't forget, he's basing everything on his shaking back and forth. This right here, this rock, which happens to be a fossil, weighs, let's say, a pound. Now, if I made that very hot, Say it weighs a pound at room temperature. If I made that extremely hot, what do you think would happen? Most people say, oh, it's going to get lighter. No, it's not. It's going to get heavier. Because electrons are what make that thing heat up. Excess electrons. And after that, when they bleed back out to room temperature, it gets cold again. Excess heat causes excess weight. Electrons have a weight to them, and the only weight is the, the black part, this is a muon. So we know that both the muon and the electron glowy part are going together into here. It's not just one or the other, it has to be both. Because this gets heavier means that the black particles going in, and it gets hotter means the white particles are going in. So there's no question they're both going in at the same time, and then there's just a bunch of ex excess in here, which will bleed out depending upon if you re reduce the temperature. All right, let's continue on with what Derek has to say. I agree, basically it's the fields pushing against the other fields. And that's why he's gonna say there's no actual wire. Listen to what he has to say. My students understood it. The only problem is, it's wrong. For one thing, 
There is no continuous conducting wire that runs all the way from a power station to your house. No, there are physical gaps, there are breaks in the line, like in transformers, where one coil of wire is wrapped on one side, a different coil of wire is wrapped on the other side, so electrons cannot possibly flow from one to the other. All right, here's where he's wrong. Electrons don't ha need a wire to flow in. Electrons are sent out through, through the atmosphere, and they bang into other electrons. And here you have a transformer, and it's, this is just a step-up transformer where it, it comes in and it, it pumps this up, and then you have more coils here, so it steps it up to whatever number of coils you have. All right, that's what a transformer does. But it, all it is using is the electrons, the same as they were in the wire, but they're just flowing through the air. That's all. And you're doubling, let's say, the, the amount of pulses because you have twice the amount of coils. You know, this is shocking me because I thought I was going to be able to present evidence that shows that there is really not enough energy flowing around that wire. However, this is a fluke clamp-on voltage and it does both at the same time. They come with a dual display, simultaneously measure voltage and current. All right, this is a fluke. See? It tells you how much current is flowing through there and how f the voltage, which is basically the pressure, the current is the amount of electricity. So it's picking up on both of those. Measure voltage and current as well as three phase measurements and phase rotation, along with Fluke Connect and iFlex compatibility. The f so there's, there's, obviously it's interfacing with the fields. There's no direct connection there. This is all insulated wires and it's just, it's just around that. So how much is actually doing the work I have to go inside the wire. On the outside, yes, you're going to have that field effect. And if this is precisely measured with the, the right kind of coils to absorb those energies and then filter them down through here and make sense out of it, well, that's, that's what you're going to be able to do is sense it. But is that actually doing the driving? No, I say no. And the reason I say no is if it was doing a driving, it would jump right to the ground. Driving is, is pushing through resistance. That's what heat is. That's what a motor is. It pushes through resistance. So I can you know, the, the part that's pushing is inside here. <laughs> this stuff is just following the guy that's pushing. Otherwise, it'd be jumping to, to ground all over the place. The actual particles that are moving are inside here. The fields that surround them, yes, are on the outside. They are not the moving particles. These are the moving particles. That's my, well, that's, that's my claim.